We had tried for about five years and it had not worked out. And um, we were gonna go look outside of the country. So we were planning to go to Russia and Korea were the two places we were considering. So he went ahead and he made the appointment for me to meet Monica Farias, who is in adoptions in Charlie. And so I went there, I believe the second week in December, and I met with her and we spent two hours talking. And by the end of the time, she showed me Elisa's picture and said, in talking to you for two hours, I just feel that this child, I haven't personally met her, but I know of her and I think she would just be perfect for your family. It's just a feeling I have. And so we were like, oh my God, I came home. I talked to my husband and as soon as the new year came, went and I went back to Monica and I said, I wanna go ahead and meet her. What is the process? One of the great things is that I noticed she had this spunk and you know, while some of the other kids, you know, were trying to get things, I mean, she just knew how to walk right in there and you can see that little leader in her right from the very beginning. So my husband and I went and we saw her and we both left saying, oh my God, we want her, we want her. We cannot imagine our life now without her. I never thought I'd have that little bundle of happiness and joy that we have. She is the best, she is our miracle. She really, really is. I feel very, very passionate and strongly about adoption, um, adopting within this country, and particularly Charlie. I, I do not have enough positive things, to, enough positive things to say. They are just, they were really to me just such a gift, such a gift. It's a known fact, and we've gone over this here, that children who feel better about themselves do better. Then you have these other kids, you know, our kids, who are in the foster care system, some of them who have been uh, uh, abused and neglected, traumatized, and have been told that they aren't worth anything. I am the adoptions recruiter, and I also serve as the MAP trainer. I um, go to churches, I go to ver various civic organizations, and I recruit people who want to become foster parents or adoptive parents. And the beautiful part for me of that is when I go out and I recruit people, I have the ability to then teach them in the actual class, which is the MAP class, which is an acronym for Model Approach to Partnership and Parenting. Um, it's a state-required course. Uh, for all prospective foster parents and adoptive parents, it's 30 hours. We, we teach them about the laws, um, the guidelines of, of how to become a foster parent and um, just give them a, a very in-depth lesson on best practices of how to become a foster parent and just um, our partnership with them as an agency. If you put in the work, I'm telling you, I've seen it too many times, they're going to give you love. You have to have a, a, a loving heart. You have to have a, a, a nurturing um, spirit. You have to have patience because a lot of our children have been victimized. They, they come, come out of abuse, uh, neglect, abandonment um, issues, and, and they've seen some things that no child should ever have to see. When I first met Carla, she looked at me and she kind of had this smirk on her face. Oh well, you're just another one of those people. I know how to handle you. <laughs> that was Carla's look. <laughs> I, I didn't really like Stephanie at first because like, I don't know, I just, I was just mad at everybody. Carla at that particular time had been disruptive in the shelter and the shelter had asked for her removal. When Carla came to me, she was very withdrawn she didn't want a part of me. She just wanted her family. But I fell in love with her, and baggage came with her, and I knew that. So I had to claim the baggage if I wanted to claim her. So I was willing to do both. It was like weird, because she was like so happy, and I'm not used to like people like 
so happy around me. It's patience and God knows it's a lot, a lot of talking and a lot of listening. You have to also listen. So I listen to her a lot. Every time I'm sad, like she, like she would, she wouldn't like ignore it. She would like want to talk about it. I didn't like talking about it all the time, but she would talk about it. And like, I didn't really have people all the time that are like really actually want to listen to what I had to say when I'm sad or something. If you're gonna do it for the money, you're doing it for the wrong reason because you'll throw in a towel. You will. But once that kid come to know you and to know that you love them and to know that you are there for them, they will start to change. Sometimes I would get in trouble and then like, she would like turn my phone off or something and then I would just come home and start cleaning up and then she would think that I'm doing it because I just want something from her when really is, it wasn't like that. So that's when I like, really like, started try to, trying to show her. And as I was showing her, I was starting to care more. The reward for me <clears throat> is that I've seen this kid at her worst. And now knowing that I had a hand in the outcome and the young lady that she's become today. That's my reward. Before I was Barbara. Now I'm her mom. Now I'm her mom. It's not an easy task to do because, you know, being an adopted parent or a foster parent is not for everybody. So when we do finally place a child with that particular family, and now they got this child in their home, and it makes all the difference in the world. That is the reward right there. Seeing them interact with that child like it's their own child. And it's not their own child. This is someone else's child that was born. But they take it upon themselves to make a difference in that child's life. And that's the beautiful part of it. That's why we do what we do.